Live from Fargo and serving you on TV, online, and on the go, this is Valley News Live at 5. The Fargo School Board gave more clarity to parents and students today by making major decisions on the upcoming school year. But the question on whether children will start classes online, in person, or a combination of both still hasn't been decided. Valley News Team's Joshua Pagero joins us in the studio now live to explain. Joshua. Andrew, while school board members unanimously agreed on postponing the first day of classes to, to September 2nd, the vote in approving a restart plan was 7 to 2. Let's look at some key points from today's meeting. Enrollment for a virtual academy, academy begins on Saturday and will be open for about a week. Students must commit at least a semester if they want to study strictly online. An education plan for students with special needs will not be released until next week. On August 10th, a newly formed committee will meet to decide how classes should begin, whether hybrid, in person, or online. This was a point of disagreement for some board members. They want more face-to-face -face time between students and teachers. But uh, the economics of this distance learning, some parents are going to be facing nightmares. If you don't start conservative enough and things don't go well, then you're just going to go backwards, right? Now, today's session with school board members lasted for about six hours and all agreed that this plan is fluid and can change. Each student from kindergarten to 12th grade, to 12th grade will be receiving either an iPad or a laptop. The district says if students are at the school, they will provide a daily mask for them as they will be required to wear one. Andrea? All right. Thanks, Joshua. Tomorrow, Fargo Public Schools will be releasing its final plans and hold a news conference with media. We have today's meeting on our VNL News app. West Fargo Public Schools is set to release their return to learn plan for schools tomorrow at 11 a.m. School leaders say the plan will cover five main areas. The guidance from the state used to create the plan, the process they used, what stakeholders can expect to see in the plan, what will not be in the plan, and the next steps for families and staff. With just two weeks until the first day of school, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz announced the state's safe learning plan this afternoon. Walz says the state will work individually with school districts to decide whether students go back to school in person, virtually, or a mixture of both this fall, based on each county's COVID-19 data. Valley News Team's crime and safety reporter Bailey Hurley breaks down how school districts will decide which learning model is safest and how the learning model could change, along with COVID cases. Governor Tim Walsh says the first day of school this year will be unlike anything we've ever seen, as the learning type from district to district could vary drastically depending on their county's COVID-19 data. The Minnesota Department of Health will work with districts and local health experts throughout the school year, using graphs like these to decide which of the three learning models is the safest. Wall says the determining metric is the biweekly case rate over 14 days, saying a rate of 10 or more cases per 10,000 people is considered elevated risk. However, Wall stresses the county level data is not the end all be all. Rather, he says it just helps establish a baseline. Walls says the plan prioritizes keeping younger students in the classroom, as transmission is likely less common among younger children and because in-person learning is especially important at that age. The plan also requires school districts to give families the option of distance learning no matter which learning model their school district chooses, saying it's important families are not forced to choose between their health and education. Bailey Hurley. Valley News Live. Coming up tonight on Valley News Live at 9 and 10 at 10, we break down what the new guidelines could look like for students and schools here in the Valley. The radar is quiet again today, and I haven't heard any complaints yet, but I guess I don't work in the weather department. Let's find out about tonight with Justin in your first alert forecast. Hey, Justin. And uh, hello, Andrew. Good evening, everybody. Yes, temperature is not bad for this time of year. Uh, temperatures around the region, if we could go to max two, are in the uh, in the 80s. Let's take a look at where they are right now. Uh, we're into the low 80s out toward Jamestown and Devil's Lake, upper 70s into Lakes Country and mid 80s into the northern valley. Valley and the dew points across the region into the mid 50s. So dry air into our eastern counties, lower 60s from Fargo out toward Devil's Lake. So a little bit of uh, humidity creeping in, but still not bad compared to last week. Now the winds across the region flipping around from a north northwesterly direction to more of a southeasterly direction. Winds not that bad right now, 5 to 15 miles per hour, but that southerly wind will warm us up even further tomorrow. Mainly clear across the region. We're going to have to wait until Friday. 
Friday for our next chance of some showers and thunderstorms. Until then, mainly clear as temperatures fall back through the 70s. We'll have that full seven day forecast coming up a little later on the newscast. Right. Sounds good. Thanks, Justin. A 23 year old man is now facing charges for allegedly terrorizing tenants at a North Fargo apartment building. This morning, police were dispatched to the Graver Inn for a fire alarm going off. Residents told police a man ripped off the handle to the security door and then entered the building. Witnesses also told police the man tried to enter occupied apartments and threatened the people inside. Police found Aaron Hadley on the third floor of the apartment building covered in his own blood. They say he appeared to be under the influence of an unknown drug. A man was taken to a hospital after jumping from a window to escape a fire in North Fargo this morning. The fire broke out just before 1.30 a.m. at 3rd Street North and caused major damage to the unit. The man who lived in that unit jumped out of a window to escape the smoke and flames. He's now in a hospital with unknown injuries. Fire officials are investigating the cause. We have updated data for the coronavirus pandemic in our region. The Minnesota Department of Health is reporting 745 new cases of COVID-19 and five new deaths. In total, there are 1,594 deaths and 5,133 active cases. In North Dakota, there have been 75 new cases of COVID-19. The daily positive case percentage is at 1.9%. There has also been another death linked to the illness, bringing the state total to 103. There are 1,017 active cases in the state. For the full report from both states, you can check out the VNL News app. The chief of the World Health Organization says spikes in the number of new COVID-19 cases in some countries were driven partly by young people letting down their guard, uh, but that the world needs to learn to live with the virus. He made those comments during a briefing in Geneva today. Evidence suggested that spikes of cases in some countries are being driven in part by younger people letting down their guard during the Northern Hemisphere summer. Yesterday, France reported almost 1,400 new cases, the highest daily increase in more than a month. Britain also reported 763 new confirmed cases. President Donald Trump is floating the idea of postponing Election Day. The president tweeting the suggestion this morning. It's one he has no power to enforce, stating, quote, with universal mail-in voting, not absentee voting, which is good, 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history. It will be a great embarrassment to the USA. That tweet following one where the president said, quote, mail-in voting is already proving to be a catastrophic disaster, end quote. Only Congress can change the date for the presidential general election. After days of tributes, civil rights leader John Lewis is being laid to rest today. Michelle Miller is outside the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta with more on the longtime congressman's funeral. The casket of Congressman John Lewis arrived at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta for his final farewell. He was an American icon, and yet he was never caught up with his own sense of self-importance. He was always focused on the mission. Former Presidents Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi were among the dignitaries who came to pay tribute to the civil rights icon. Lewis's body arrived in Georgia Wednesday after leaving the U.S. Capitol for the last time. Mourners greeted him in Atlanta, lining the streets as his hearse rolled through downtown. May his words, actions, and legacy continue to serve as our country's conscience. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp and Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms praised Lewis for his lifelong fight for equality. Bottoms said his push to get into trouble good trouble has inspired her actions as a leader. And so, Governor, when the good trouble continues, know that it is with the blessings of Congressman Lewis. Lewis delivered his own final message to civil rights activists in an essay published in the New York Times this morning. He wrote, though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. A man who inspired generations went on to say that today's activist inspired him and filled him with hope. Michelle Miller, CBS News, Atlanta. During the funeral service, Ebenezer Baptist Church, along with several others around the country, rang their bells for 80 seconds to honor the 80 years of John Lewis's life.
Former Republican presidential candidate Herman Cain has died after a battle with COVID-19. Cain ran for president in 2012, at one time leading in the polls. He was a business executive at various companies, including Burger King and Godfather's Pizza. Cain had attended President Trump's campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma in June. Less than two weeks later, he was diagnosed with the coronavirus. Herman Cain was 74 years old. Still ahead on Valley News Live at 5, meet the seniors who are using their voices to entertain and stay connected during the pandemic. And the first part of the day tomorrow looks good with more sunshine, but we do have a chance of some showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon. Details coming up.